Hello, dear brothers and sisters. Today, we are going to uh, reflect upon some readings that are read in the Orthodox Church according to the liturgical calendar that was read last Sunday. Today, this Sunday, we reflected upon a reality that Jesus Christ brings to people's attention repeatedly. The Gospel reading from the liturgy was about the blind man who was born blind and that we look at him and see him in a kind of a conflicted situation where his disciples question whether or not this blindness was somebody's fault, that he was at fault, that he had sinned or his parents had sinned. That's why he was born blind. Jesus very quickly answers, gives them a very comprehensive answer saying that it's neither his sin or his parents' sin, but rather that's for the glory of God, so that the glory of God will be shown. And what was the glory of God in this situation is that he taking clay, he recreates the blind person's eyes and asks him to go and wash in the water spring and then the blind man starts to see. So just to give you a little bit background about the story is that Jesus was coming out of the synagogue where he was accused, where he was threatened. And the evangelist says that they took stones into their hands to kill him for healing someone on Sabbath day. And Jesus comes and shows to his opponents the glory of God, that he is the creator the creator that gave the law and set the Sabbath and that he was going to remind them uh, perhaps later that God still works and that it is his decision as a creator to uh, heal or to take out of the trouble someone whom he loves. And in this situation, Christ kind of comes out and does this awesome work recreating the eyes of the blind man to show the glory of God in his humanity. Christ then has a conversation with the people who were surrounding him. And he talks about blindness. And he talks about sin. That it's the sin that makes people blind. But he does not talk about the physical blindness. His disciples speak about this blind man who was physically blind and they kind of try to see if sin causes this physical blindness. But Christ turns the tables around and he says that, yes, sin causes blindness, but not this kind of blindness, but blindness of the heart, the blindness of the eyes, of the mind. And he talks to the Pharisees and the scribes saying that if you knew that you were blind, you would not have sin. But because you think you can see, you are in your sin remaining. So we are going to talk about this concept of blindness and of vision. How can we see? What do we see with our physical eyes? And what do we see with the eyes of our heart, of our mind? And we will kind of draw a parallel to the reality of darkness and light. Because vision and blindness is ultimately connected with darkness and light. As bright as our vision may be, we will not be able to see anything if we are in darkness. And sometimes light can cause blindness. That sometimes we are not accustomed to be in the bright light and we won't be able to see because of it. Or we don't want the light to shine because as Christ says in the first chapter of John's Gospel, when the light shines, our dark works are revealed and we don't want that to happen. Therefore, we prefer darkness over light because in darkness 
we feel more secure. And that's what Jesus tries to have his disciples understand. That brightness of the light is essential in their lives. And Christ calls himself the light of the world. And he also tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. So those who receive Christ, he says, will sit in the light, will remain in the light, and they will not stumble. We know perfectly well that if we walk in the darkness and we do not see what's in front of our feet, we stumble. Just one simple thing is necessary to turn on the light and we will see everything that is around us. But that requires courage because when you turn on the light, you see other things. You see a lot more than those things that you were stumbling over. And sometimes those who have created things in the darkness don't necessarily want the light to be turned on so that their works will not be revealed. And this is kind of the context of the story. The blind man who was physically blind did not prefer darkness over light. In another story of a blind man, the blind man actually goes after Jesus and asks for mercy so that his eyes will be open. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he says. But those in Galilee were sitting in the darkness and they were not willing to move out of it. Our favorite theologian, John Chrysostom, talks about this very precisely, saying that the Galileans did not even walk in the darkness, but they were sitting in the darkness. Therefore, a will is required to come out of the darkness, to wake up from our sleep and get up from our sitting position and start walking towards the light, towards life. So, in comparison to the blind man, those who were surrounding him, although could see physically, but they could not see the light. And as I said, Christ calls himself the light, the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, you will be in the light, he says. You will walk in light, not in darkness. But those who refused to see the light, regardless how bright their eyesight was, they took stones to stone him. And it is very interesting when in the synagogue, Jesus is in this contradicting condition situation where he has done a good deed and people are receiving it as an evil act and they're trying to stone him, meaning what he had done was perceived as a sin worthy uh, to be punished by death. The evangelist says that he walks through them and they cannot see him and he walks out of the synagogue. And right immediately, he heals the person who was blind. And a blind man comes back from the spring, having washed his eyes, and he can see Christ. So this shows that the blindness of their heart and their mind extended to their eyes, where in a physical world, in a daylight, they could not see the Lord. They could not see Jesus walking through the crowd. And he walked freely out of the synagogue and no one threw a stone. This is not one occasion only. In another occasion, they take him to the cliff so that they can throw him off the cliff and get rid of him. But again, Christ very quietly, very peacefully walks through the crowd and no one does any harm to him. And in both instances, it is very clear that either they could not see him or they were kind of stunned, astonished, that they couldn't do anything. And in this situation, Christ shows them that he is the master of our hearts, he is the master of our mind. 
and He is here to heal those who are seeking for the light, to give them the vision of the heart and the mind so that they can see Him. A perfect example for this is the epistle reading, which is actually from the Acts, Acts 26, that was read last Sunday in the Orthodox Church. The story of St. Paul being in front of King Agrippas. And St. Paul receives the permission to speak in front of the king. The king asks him to defend himself. And St. Paul goes on and tells about his journey to Damascus. On the way to Damascus, he says, where I was going to persecute Christians, I saw this bright light, brighter than the sun. And in the result, I lost my vision. And I heard a voice coming from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There is a parallel between St. Paul going to Damascus and those in the synagogue taking stones in their hands and trying to stone Christ. They were ready to stone Christ and kill him at the synagogue and St. Paul was kind of punishing the body of our Lord, the body of the Christians. And that is why Christ shows up to him and asks him why St. Paul, in that, at that time he was called Saul, is persecuting him because the body of God, the body of Christ is his people. And St. Paul had a permission from the high priest and the authorities to go around and arrest all the Christians and persecute them and execute them. And he had just been a witness of the killing of first deacon Stephen. And it says in the story at the Acts that they put his clothes under his feet. In other words, he was the one who was in charge of these mobsters who were going around and persecuting Christians namely persecuting Christ himself. And it is interesting that in the story of St. Paul, the light that shines in front of him actually causes physical blindness. And St. Paul had to walk to someone else to ask him to heal him. And little pieces of sand or things that seem like sand pieces came out of his eyes and his vision was restored partially. But from that time on, St. Paul can see the truth. And the truth had come to free him, to reveal to him the reality, that he was in a parallel reality. It was in a, in a reality that was fake, and that he was persecuting the truth. As we can see in uh, the conversation between Pilate and Jesus, Pilate asks him, what is the truth? And we know Christ's answer was, I am the truth. So by persecuting Christ, St. Paul was actually in reality trying to avoid the truth, trying to persecute the truth itself. And when the light shines, when Christ shines in the sky, his eyes, his physical eyes are blinded and the eye of his heart is opened. And now he becomes the greatest of the apostles. And he goes on and preaches Christ all over the Mediterranean area that was known to be the world at that time. So as we can see, blindness, darkness, light have kind of relative meanings in these stories because one person is blind but can see Christ. Another person is perfectly capable of seeing everything else but denies Christ and persecutes Him. One person claims to be able to see, but cannot see his own sins, and therefore remains in his sins. Another person 
being blind, goes after Christ and asks for mercy. We know that the mercy is to come to heal our wounds that are caused by the sins. So, in one side we see that the daylight does not reveal the reality, but the light, the uncreated light that shines and blinds St. Paul, or Saul at that time, reveals to him the deeper truth that his heart is opened and he can see the truth now. So this is the reality of Christianity, where in a world things look very differently than they, they are in, in correct light, in perfect light, in God's light. And so Christ showing his disciples this reality of healing the blind man wants to show them that they need this kind of vision. And when he has a conversation with Peter, who proclaims that Jesus is the Son of the living God, he later on pulls his disciples aside and tells them that they have eyes and they cannot see, they have ears, they cannot hear, and their hearts are hardened so that they cannot comprehend the reality, the truth. And partially is because right immediately after Peter confesses him to be a son of the living God, he tries to contradict to what is to happen in the near future. He tries to protect Jesus from something that was going to be done for the sake of the salvation of human race that Christ had predicted that he will go through the suffering and the crucifixion, and that his disciples also have to take their crosses and follow him. And in this situation, Peter, who was not ready to receive this kind of heavy news, contradicts with him, and right immediately Jesus takes them to the side and then they start talking about the bread not being enough for every one of them. Christ tells them that he has multiplied the bread for 5,000 people. He has multiplied it for 4,000 people. But those miracles weren't enough for a human mind to be able to receive the truth to be able to receive their sight, to be able to hear the way that God wants them to hear, to be able to open their hearts to God alone and clean the heart from all kinds of things that are there so that it's not clogged and there is space for God. We have all these wonderful stories that kind of tell about the reality that exists beyond our physical vision, that we need to work on our spiritual sight, that we need to work on our spiritual vision, our heart's vision, our mind's vision. But how do we do that? In the morning gospel, we see that Jesus is resurrected. As you probably already know, all morning gospels from Orthros, from the morning service in the Orthodox Church, are about the resurrection, unless they are celebrated on weekdays. But all Sunday morning Gospels are about the resurrection. And last Sunday we read the story of Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. And the thing that happened, the event that happens at Jesus' tomb when he was freshly resurrected from the dead, First, Mary finds out that the tomb was empty, that the stone was rolled away. Then she hears a voice and she turns around and she sees someone in a bright, bright light. In such a bright light that she cannot recognize who he was until he speaks with her, calling her by name. So this is another story showing the difference of the reality. The person that had 
been with Mary for a long time. Mary had seen him perform many miracles. Now in this state of resurrection, where he is in much glory and in gloomous light, Mary cannot recognize him. And only after she's called by name that she recognizes that this is the Lord. Another story that is about the vision and being able to recognize God or find God or see God in our hearts is the story of the travelers to Emmaus. Throughout the whole journey, Jesus speaks with them, but they cannot recognize him. Outside, in the world, they are walking with their master who has been with them at least three years and perhaps even longer. They knew him from the time before his ministry had started in this world. But they walk miles and miles and they take him as a stranger. And only at the end of the journey, when they enter into a house, the evangelist says, and when they break bread together, that's when their eyes are opened. And this has a very symbolic meaning. Going into a house is one thing. The word house is known to be used throughout the whole entire Bible. The word house was used when Jacob built a little altar after he had a dream and he was struggling against God's angel or God himself. He was wrestling with God. After all this miraculous vision and God's re revelation, Jacob pl uh, places stones near each other and he calls it the place, the house, and that is the dwelling place of God. In many other places, like the tabernacle in the Exodus, was the dwelling place, the house of God. The temple that the Jews built after they entered into the promised land was the house of worship, the house of God, the place where God dwells. And in the same way, this place, this house that he enters with his disciples, with two disciples of the travelers of the Emmaus, is called the house, the place where Christ breaks the bread. And this is kind of the replica of the Last Supper. Again, Jesus tells his disciples to go to this particular house, the upper room, and tell the master that, of the house that the Lord is going to eat his uh, supper here. The Pascha meal he is going to share with his disciples in this house. And in that house is that he gives the bread to his disciples as his body and the wine gives to his disciples as his blood. And he commands them to do this for his memory the rest of their life. The rest of the life of the church in the kingdom of God in the house of God, this has to be done periodically, repetitively, so that our eyes will be opened the same exact way that the eyes of the travelers of Emmaus were opened. When Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it, the travelers, his friends who had walked with him, immediately recognize him. And they talk to themselves and say, how come our hearts did not burn inside of us? The living God, the Son of the living God was walking with them. And this shows the human ignorance that if we are willing to walk the mile, the extra mile, to find the Lord, we will be blessed. And like the 
blind man who was crying after Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If we are willing to walk that extra mile and join the blind man and ask him for his mercy, his mercy will come upon us as it came in that place, in that house, on the travelers of Emmaus, and their hearts were moved, and the eyes were opened, and they recognized that this is the Lord. To just conclude today's presentation about this beautiful reality of spiritual vision, we are to recognize, first of all, that we are blind. Not blind physically, but blind spiritually. The scientists say, show me your God and I will worship that God. I will accept it. But we do not recognize that being able to see God does not depend to anyone else, but it depends only on the person who wants to see God. That it is that person who is through hard work, has to walk that extra mile to enter into the house where Christ breaks the bread and shares with his friends. And in that breaking of the bread, within the community of the Lord, within the body of the Lord, is where we can only and only recognize and remember that this was the Lord. Sometimes people say that we walk with Christ everywhere. Christ is everywhere. God is everywhere present. That is true. But it is amazing that Christ was present. God was present with the disciples throughout the whole journey, but they did not recognize Him until they shared bread with Him. So this is the conclusion of today's talk. Let us walk together and share bread with Lord and recognize that He is the Son of the living God, now and forever. Amen.